<laughs> doing some rearranging. Dude, While I, you're doing... this, I don't want a couple of things here. I usually move these out of the way. Okay. A toe update. Uh, Remember that picture? Yeah, of... that horrible thing on your toe. That bl- I mean, black that and blue when accent. I broke it. <laughs> Yeah, that uh, about was about a month ago. And really, uh, oh, it's broken. Bad. It looked like you may have broken it. I was oh, telling for you, sure, you want to see somebody on that. Yeah, well, you they could. can't do anything about it. You just tape it up, and that's oh, all you can do. Okay. And it was getting a lot better. And I did some hard cardio the last couple of days. It hurts like hell. Oh, oh that sucks. I hate yeah. to hear that. Oh, well, it's just Are you a limping. Toe. Like, does it make oh. you limp? I'm now limping. I oh, wasn't. Geez, I was doing you're one of those limpers. I went backwards. Yeah, dude, we are. We're live. We're live. We caught you rearranging the room and everything. What? No. <laughs> yeah. Welcome to Over 50 Starting Over. I'm Barry Edwards. And I'm Merle Garrison. <laughs> and it's a show where we just talk about various things as our life changes. We try to improve upon our careers, even ourselves, as we go along. And we also then we segue into kind of metaphysical uh, subjects often. Could be religion, could be UFOs. I got that down in my notes. I want to talk about Ooh, that. I like that subject. Ghosts. Yeah. Ghosts. Afterlife Ghosts. stuff. Man, we got to, yeah. But you know, we'll get we'll go far down that rabbit hole. And we, so then our third segment is current events slash politics. So we kind of try to keep this rolling so that we don't ah, get stuck on any one subject for too long. So Merle, to start off the 050 part, I wanted to talk about just obviously whatever I'm doing currently in my week, I always try to apply to the over 50 starting over section. Yeah. And I'm working on some marketing, uh, some marketing programs for two different clients and I need assistance when I do these because it's, well, I try to do everything myself. That's always a bad idea. And right. so I started out with the one and he, uh, boy, I don't want to get too far down that, uh, that track about what all he does, but it's a lawyer that sells some things that help encourage employee ownership of a company. Okay. And, so LinkedIn is a, a really great avenue for him to market to other financial uh, planners and things like that, that, that would resell, in a sense, his product. And so this, uh, the subject that I'm trying to approach here and make sense of it for people is outsourcing. And mm-hmm. that is the magic bullet that, if you don't know better, is, well, I need an online presence, so I'm going to you know, go online and look somebody up from somewhere in the world, you know, usually India or something like that, and get all this done for $3 an hour. And you know, there's so many pluses and minuses to that because I use this as an aspect to my company. I have been for about 10 years, if not more. And so I just wanted to... Uh, clarify the pluses and minuses. So with the LinkedIn marketing thing, you know what's the tough part for me is trying to scrape those leads off of there. Mm. It's very tedious and time-consuming process, but it's very quantifiable. So this is an ideal place for me to outsource and get somebody in. And first of all, I'll say, when you can outsource from anyone in the world, and I have pretty much, I like India. I like uh, India is so vast and so varied, but in general, they got a lot of good, smart, hard workers there. Uh, so I do like them. Love the Philippines. Uh, huh. Probably mostly. Love really? The, yeah. They're, uh, oh, and I'll say what you can't go wrong with, because anytime I look for a virtual assistant, a VA, Always, I go to the Philippines for that. Really? Uh, they're really uh, conscientious, hard workers, very honest, and the price to quality is really high. Uh, so I really like them a whole bunch. Uh, I'm not going to badmouth any of the other countries, but I like these the most. But it has to be when you're outsourcing uh, and you're looking for that good price, it has to be quantifiable stuff. 
So like I said, with the LinkedIn marketing thing, I found somebody that can help me gain those leads so that then I can pump out some information to them quite efficiently Hmm. and uh, come up with a pretty good cost-effective marketing program there. Now, on the other hand, uh, I, with my other client, I'm use, I'm going to use the same approach. I kind of put this together as what I've been working on all week. And it's like, Ooh, I got something here. And so I'm also going to uh, offer it to this other client, but he's also looking for a Google ads approach. Okay. So when you're going through search results, looking for something in those top listings there at the top, you may or may not notice their ads. That's mm-hmm, mm-hmm. ads. And with that, I'll only look within the United States. And okay. yeah, the reason for that is, is it, it's very complicated. Big money is at stake. It's, it's, a, it's a toss between being uh, almost engineering kind of smart and being creative smart. And, any, and there's so much money at stake that, and if you don't know what you're looking for, that um, you can lose big dollars real quickly. And in my case, I can lose nice clients real quickly. So I want to be, there's accountability within the United States that you don't have overseas. So Mm -hmm, you mm -hmm. might say, well, these people are being rated on Upwork or Fiverr or whatever. Those ratings are incredibly difficult to uh, really assess. People can say about anything over there and you can't say, worse is you can't sue anybody. You Mm -hmm. can give someone a bad rating, sure. But the first thing they do is come back and beg you to give them a five-star rating. So it's, so when you're going through and trying to assess, it's just like hire, it's just like going through 20 resumes to hire somebody in the mm-hmm. traditional sense. It's very much the same thing. And it's really disconcerting when you feel like you got bamboozled. Mm-hmm. So in a lot of respects, I def, I definitely stay within the United States, anything creative. Um, I have a whole article on this, on my, uh, Edwards communications website. So that's edwardscom.net. And the article is the three ways to create a logo logo for your brand identity. And it does talk about, yes, you can do, uh, uh, overseas super cheap, but you better be a hell of an art director. Okay. You better know what you're looking for, what's good, what's bad. But the worst part is, is you don't know when they're just throwing a clip art with some, uh, with some type, and you could end up being sued for not having rights to it. Mm, yeah. Wow. So well, there, yeah. this is interesting. I, I, one of the things that I was thinking about while you were talking is your own business. And you have mentioned before that uh, you oftentimes are competing with overseas people. And, you know, how does how is that affecting you? I mean, I know you and I know you're a person of quality. So usually quality comes with a cost and yeah, quantity does. is uh, never the quality that you're looking for. Tell me a little bit, bit about that. That's a really, really good question. And it does go along. I kind of explain it in that article I just mentioned, because it, it fortunately weeds out the people that I don't want to work with in the first place. <laughs> and a lot of, I'll tell you straight up, Merle, a lot of who I work with building on a whole brand can, can encompass all of, uh, and often does redesigning a logo, coming up with a slogan, which people did not ever do in the first place properly, the mission and vision statements, building out the website and coming up with value propositions to position the pro- their services properly. And there's more to it, but that's it in a nutshell. And uh, I'm, it's funny, I'm seeing new leads coming in for my Google AdWords uh, thing that I was talking about just now. But so uh, I probably a big niche for me is redesigning stuff after people have done it the wrong way long right, enough right. and I find out they're leaving a lot of money on the table. Oh, it's worth a few grand for me, especially for somebody who has a valuation, a, a new acquisition valuation, meaning they gain a new client and that's worth maybe $2,000 a year to them for a new mm-hmm, client. Mm-hmm. It could be a thousand dollars. If you get, it could be $250, but if there's a lot of clients on the line, so 
you know, it adds up in that way. Well, you don't want to leave a ton of money on the table. So invest a few grand here or 10 grand here, whatever it takes in order to do it wisely. The, the biggest thing you have to look at when you're considering whether you're outsourcing overseas or keeping it in, uh, in here uh, in the United States is your return on investment. And right. Yeah, that, that's number one. So you, you have to know, first of all, give assessment to what your talents are. Like, can you assess? If you don't know anything about what you're outsourcing, I suggest you stay within the United States where you have a better, uh, what's the word I'm looking for The when you're validating people? Um, not thinking of the word, but when you're validating people uh, in the United States, uh, your reviews and your reputation are so much more succinct. It, it, it's so much more by the nature of our laws and everything else. Right, right. It's more yeah. honest. So I get what you're saying. Okay. Yeah, you know, I mean, and and you do have that. It seems like great advice because you do have in other countries – a lot more ways that they can take advantage of the situation. And the thing that you mentioned earlier is that if you if you need to take legal action, you can't really do that with people that are out of the country and then you are out of luck. That, that sounds like a horrible way to go. And I'd really hate to is. have to explain it to my business partner that the reason we lost all our money is because I took a chance on somebody somewhere in China and it just didn't work out. Sorry. Yeah. Remember how I told you I was saving us like $3,000? Yeah. Well, <laughs> that didn't work out so well. <laughs> Trying to explain that. But I will say, first and foremost, hands down, as I said before, something like virtual assistance, which can take so much busy work off your hand, you can definitely do that because it's very quantifiable. Um, certain kind of, I, I outsource a lot of programming. I need an application to go on my website right. that it needs – to do this, A, B, and C. That's very quantifiable. Mm -hmm. So those kinds of things I do. Those I just, are easy. And then, yeah. but the other things that take a creative risk, uh, you are ambiguous. Keep this in the country. Yeah, for sure. Even strategies. I would very much caution against uh, trying to collaborate with somebody overseas on, on strategies. For one, our laws. We have a way of doing things over here that every country does things, even uh, kind of in the back of their minds. They just have a different way of doing things. We have a, I'll, I'll say this too. We have the highest quality standard in the world. I noticed that from outsourcing. Mm. Uh, there's just a lot of accountability here. So this isn't to pitch, Hey, keep everything, uh, in the U S this is just to pitch how to be careful. So you don't get burned. Right. You know, there's one thing I hate and I tell all my friends this, I hate when I'm penny wise dollar foolish and, uh, you know, Hey, who doesn't want to save some money here and there, but when I, when I think that I'm saving $50 to buy this cheaper product and then I got to turn around and pay, I'm like, ah, I'm done with this garbage. I'm buying the real thing for $150. That <laughs> burns my, you know, I get so I totally get it with my son. <clears throat> so that's I, I remember, my rant on that. I remember as a kid, I, uh, I bought a watch and uh, it looked like a Rolex. And I think... <laughs> I think it, it might have been a Molex. <laughs> but, but anyway, I bought it for like, I don't know, under $100. When yeah. It looked like a $5,000 watch, but a, a week later it went, boy, yo, 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 yo. For sure. So, uh, so that's hey, my I, rant. I love it. I love it, Barry. Hey, I got something to bring up. Uh, I want to hear it. We had a viewer who uh, reached out on LinkedIn to me. Her name is Diane, and she uh, started, she's starting a new company and uh, at, at age 54. It's a legal services com company, and she mentioned that, yeah, this is scary stuff. And, and it is, you know, starting over in anything. And I don't know if it's just when you're, you're in your 50s or older. I think just starting anything new is scary. Yeah, and putting your neck out there, buddy. Yeah, you're you really are. You're putting a lot on the but you know, any time you make a, take a risk like that, hey, there's a there's a big chance of failure. 
But if you, but sometimes it's those failures that actually cause you to learn the most. I mean, look at Thomas Edison. It was, he, he, what was it? Something like a thousand different experiments to get to the light bulb. Thank God he didn't quit at nine ninety nine. We all I love that. dark, literally right I now. Love that. I, 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 I just want to say. Uh, Oh, I want ahead. you to get back on that, but um, there's two things. First, I wanted to ask you what kind of legal services, if you know, if you could expound on that just a little bit. But I wanted to, let's not just gloss over, starting a new venture, you're putting your hard-earned money out on the line, you're, and you're taking such a chance on yourself personally that do I have the perseverance, do I have the innate intelligence do i have the motivation to get up every day and do what it need do what needs to get done to be successful dude you are putting as a person you're putting everything out on the line there so it's really scary i commend those that do and also seek the kind of advice that you need in order to uh head off those dangers those perils before you start going down that channel Boy, that is a good tip right there. I love what you're saying right there. You know, I uh, looked up um, online just people that had started over after age 50 and uh, the famous people that had started mm -hmm. over after age 50 and a few very uh, recognizable names came up and I just wanted to go over a couple of them. One of them was... Oh, Colonel but you didn't go finish... Ahead. You didn't finish with our friend with the legal services start. I knew you were gonna do that. Okay, go ahead. What is what what what's the question again? Uh well for one, I wanted to ask what kind of legal services. That's kind of a wide gamut right there. Yeah, it is. And uh, that's uh, the reason I didn't go into it is because I didn't know. <laughs> so thanks okay. a lot, Barry. <laughs> <laughs> well, okay. But well, but they're they're um but she was in the legal department at a, a corporation that I used to work with and now she's taken those skills and she started her own business. And so uh, I know that she is not an attorney herself. She was an assistant to to our, our legal attorney. So uh, she knows a lot about that. And I think this is a business where she's helping people to access services that um, are sometimes hard to access. I mean, you know, when things come up in, in your, my own life and I need an attorney, it's like, where do I turn? And I believe that this business is helping with that. So Diane, I hope I did justice to what you're doing out there. I wish you all the luck, but some Stay in touch that with us. I, and, and I've asked her to do that too. So, nice. but, but I just wanted to be encouraging here because there's so many people that have started over uh, after age 50 and They've become household names, and a couple of them are Colonel Sanders, uh, Kentucky Fried Chicken. Really? He, he started that late? He didn't start until he was 65. Oh! You Six, mean he five, didn't have that four. white beard when he was like 14 years old? He, he probably had a, a darker beard at that time. <laughs> <laughs> but uh, Ray Kroc's another one. I mean, here's McDonald's and KFC. Now, Ray Kroc was a, a milkshake machine salesman, and he walked into the McDonald's Brothers restaurant and got an idea to run this franchise. So franchising was big for both of these people. They we kind also of started have, it, didn't they? They originated it. it, it I mean, I right, exactly. They, I mean, this was the whole concept that they started, and, of course, All many right. millionaires are, are – the result of that whole thing. A couple of uh, lesser known people, uh, Ronald Reagan, I'm just kidding about that. Uh, <laughs> you know, Ronald Reagan was a great actor. Well, at least a good actor before, uh, before he went into politics, but he didn't get elected to a public office until he was 55 years old. Hmm. So that's interesting. That's, as long as we're talking about presidents, Donald Trump was in his late 60s when he became elected. He never held a public office before. Talk about starting over. And, and there went half of our listeners. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> uh, there a couple of other ones. Uh, a guy by the name of Jack Cover. Never heard of him before, but you'll know exactly who this guy is because he's the guy that started at age 50 a company called Taser Tech. 
And now uh, it, he, almost everybody's got some kind of uh, uh, device here to protect themselves against an assailant. I know that I bought one for my wife. So you, oh. these, it's a pretty important thing right there. And then finally, I'll say uh, Laura Ingalls Wilder, as most of us know, was uh, on Little House of the Prairie. In the pr Little House on the Prairie. On the Prairie, yeah. Yep. I never watched it, but I, I heard it was a good show. I, you know, I'm not allowed to say that I watched that, <laughs> but uh, it, it, well, it's not cool. But uh, anyway, she was great on the show, apparently. But she started a children's book uh, writing deal in her 50s, and now she's very famous for these wow. children's books. So the deal is this, is it's never too late to get started on something new. And I found that to be encouraging when I looked at it as well. No, I totally agree. You know, I just wanted to say about that. You got me thinking about that whole McDonald's thing. There was that excellent movie that was up for Academy Awards about that. Do you, do you remember the name of Michael Keaton? Michael Starter? Keaton, yeah. I, I, now, I don't movie. remember the name of it, but um, uh, boy, I, and I haven't seen it either, but I, gosh. Oh, Michael you got to see it. Was a, um, I've seen him just pictures or, or clips of this, and it was like, Michael Keaton? That's Michael Keaton? <laughs> Jeez, he looks just like Ray Kroc in that movie. Hey, you know, I know I'm getting off subject here, but talking about acting jobs that are just amazing, I don't know if you happen to see it. Probably not yet. And now I can't think of the name of the movie, but I think it's in the theaters right now. Lisa and I uh, just saw it. A couple, a few weeks ago, the one about Fox, uh, the company Fox, and oh yeah, about Megan Kelly. Yes, and, yeah, Charlize Theron plays her. Holy cow, man! I had to uh, go back and look her up, and like, I what I want to know is, did they digitally alter her voice? Like, it was exactly like Megan Kelly's. Apparently wow. They, I mean, scary, like, oh, my. And they did prosthetics with her to make her look like her. But, I mean, you cannot replicate a – I don't know how she replicated her voice like that. I, I You know what's interesting? I just Great saw a movie. movie, too. How are these actors and actresses able to do this? It is it is amazing. Their their talent is amazing. I, my, my son came over the other day because he was telling me that – uh, I've got to see this movie, Dr. Sleep, and I missed it in the theaters, and I didn't know what this movie was about, but it's the sequel to The Shining, which was a great movie, yes. and let me tell you what, this movie is outstanding as a sequel, probably one of the best sequels that I've seen. Is and it, it new? Oh. It, it, it just came out in the theaters at the end of 2019, so it's not in the theaters. You can get that on Blu-ray right now, and he brought the Blu-ray disc over, and we watched it. We've actually watched it twice together now because it was so good, but um, the there are some uh, characters from the old movie that are in this movie, and they are not the same characters but they are playing, so they're, they're characters playing the same age as the characters from back in the 1980 movie. And these people look and sound so much like the original characters. It's mind-blowing. It's mind-blowing. How in the world do they do this? If, if you, there, were, there were a few scenes that I thought were actually taken from the old movie, and it mm. wasn't. It was the actors, the current actors. At, it, but anyway, the storyline, I don't want to give it away if sure. you haven't seen it. The I just story put it in my notes. is outstanding and it does provide closure to it's it's about Danny Torrance. Hmm. So it, you, you know, at the end of the movie, the first movie, you're like, what is gonna happen to that little kid? That that kid's gonna be messed up. <laughs> <laughs> you know, but anyhow, so it goes through his story as an adult, and it's very good. I highly re recommend okay. that movie. I just put it in my notes on my iPhone. In my notes on my iPhone, I have a special section I, I created for movies and TV shows because I just got tired of, oh, sure, I'll remember that. Yeah, and then, you know, I, I'm yeah. looking for something to, to watch and I can't think of any of them. I, I probably got 20 or 30 in my notes right now.
You it's know, a- I, I have the same thing. I have the same problem. We were out for coffee the other day, and uh, I, uh, the, the person behind the counter, what a nice woman she was. I remember her name was Karen. Um, and she uh, asked us if we had seen that movie Once Upon a Time in Hollywood, which, uh, oh, I won't of course, that. Brad Pitt won the Best Supporting Actor for. Uh, let me tell you, Barry, if you know the story, the Madsen story, you know, and the, the, what happened there, this movie is outstanding. And I got to say, I'm kind of down on the Hollywood movies Wait. that have been out there. I, you know, as we talked about. Stuff. But, but and it is a Tarantino movie. And the guy's a great storyteller. And, you know, there's usually there's a lot of violence in Tarantino movies. And yeah. I don't like a lot of violent movies. But there's something about the way Tarantino does it that makes it very entertaining. It's not like the gore factor that you have in all these other movies. It's more like comic book kind of thing mm-hmm. that's happening. But, man, this movie is just wonderful. Get like see that movie too. That one's another good one. And I, I certainly I think will. Brad Pitt really did deserve to win that. Mm, okay, yeah, I can't wait to now. Um, I I do have to say I didn't think about that until you just said it. That Tarantino, uh, he's such a he's so inspired by the old '60s kind of pulp uh, genre. Yes. Yeah. And, so I suppose that he intentionally, he doesn't want to go that route of let's gross people out with the violence. No, nah, he kind of, he lets you suspend belief and he does it uh, pl- playfully enough that it doesn't whack you out, you know? Yeah, yeah. You stay within the playfulness of the movie. I like how he, as you were saying, it's sort of the uh, 60s kind of thing. Um, it's film noir it's yeah. the spaghetti western. Yeah. It's those uh, karate movies. All of that he puts together in a masterful way. That's his formula, and it works. I mean, it really does work. I I, I really like his movies. I heard that that fight between Brad Pitt's character and Bruce Lee was hysterical or great or something. The I, guy that played the Bruce Lee character oh, was outstanding. Of, I outstanding. heard a lot of flack about that. That I uh, thought the he was family's excellent. pissed. Really? Well, they shouldn't be because the guy, I would have thought that that was Bruce Lee. Yeah. It was, pretty, but, and, but the thing is, I can see why the family is mad because uh, of the outcome. But uh, I won't give any more away. On sure. That. And I hate when that sure. happens to me. But uh, I thought it was, I thought it was a great, the, uh, the scenes were great. They, yeah. It was a great movie. But I brought up the woman in the store because she actually recommended a movie to Anne Marie and I, which was called peanut butter falcon and it's about a, a yeah see now how in the world did i remember that but for <laughs> some reason i remembered it and then i looked it up and it's about a, a a boy that's got down syndrome back in the 1800s and he has this dream of becoming a a, a wrestler and he finds this nefarious guy that is kind of a con artist and they uh, he helps for some reason helps him to get into this wrestling business and throughout this thing they become friends uh, this man changes uh, they find god together uh, they they go they, anyway it sounds like it would be one of the they, she says it's a feel good movie so i'm going to trust her on that whole thing but uh, i haven't seen it myself but there's another one out there that sounds like it might be good that no one's heard of. Right. Well, you know, when you said it's a feel good movie, I, I can't get enough of those. They're very few and far between today. That's so true. yeah, when I got a second, I'm going to add that to my notes, peanut butter Falcon. Okay. That's just sounds so bizarre. Right. Uh, right. Do you, okay. Before we just go all the way into uh, politics, there's plenty of different things. There's so many different things. I got a bunch of stuff. stuff. Do you? Yeah, well, yeah. I, I, you know, there's one subject that I've been dying to go down, but I don't care if we do or not. We're doing a more, we happen to be doing a more whimsical show today, which I don't mind staying with. There's some Tesla stuff going on, products and stuff that I wouldn't mind talking about. But an important one is at some point, I want to talk about socialism versus capitalism. That's exactly what I want to talk about. Okay, well, let's do it. All right. What? I, I remember where this came up. No, I don't exactly remember where it came up, but it was a few weeks back during an episode. And I've always had this uh, theory that nobody seems to talk about, and it's super simple, that 
socialism sounds so appealing because of free stuff, right? Okay, who doesn't want free stuff? That, right. that everybody wants free stuff. And and then capitalism looks so evil because it's greedy people that are are taking all your stuff, not to mention not giving you free stuff. So capitalism is evil. That was a pretty simple definition, right? Easy to agree with. And I just, I, and then when you think anything through and you find out how quickly uh, socialism turns people into all of a sudden you're, you just gave your government the rights to take all of your stuff and, and then the aristocracy that's already existed will always exist, okay? They, their money is not in this country anyway. It's overseas. They're fine. You think you're going to take it for yourself. You're not. All it does is make peasants of probably anybody that uh, makes a, has previously made under $10 million or, or more than that, maybe. But so it's the greed factor. This is where everything goes wrong in my book is you have to understand. And I think this is, this is the main thing, the main difference between people on the left and people on the right. And I'll always say, I'm really in the middle, but you got to recognize where the extremes are in order to find the middle. Mm. And so the, the, what people on the uh, left seem to think is that we're all inherently really good people that want to help each other. And the world's going to be a great place if we allow that, if we just take care of the top one, two percent at the top that are evil people. Okay. And People on the right, I, I'm not sure what the direct, here's what I know is I think people, all people are inherently greedy. It's part of a human nature that stems from the survival instinct. We need, we need safety and then we need food and water. And when those are not in abundance, we're screwed. Okay. Mm -hmm. There is nothing else that matters. Your, the, the quality of your sneakers and your iPhone do not matter if you're hungry and thirsty. Um, and so that's where our so-called greedy nature comes in. So while that's – and that's what I – I, I want to get you in here now. That's my basic premise is I think that's where socialism goes wrong is because they believe that people are inherently nice – and I say people are inherently greedy. And so the politicians immediately become aristocracy along with aristocracy. And you just make peasants out of everybody else. That's what I think. Yeah. So I, I agree with most of what you're saying here and, and that we do live in a fallen world. That's my Christian terminology is that we live in a fallen world. And so therefore we do tend to have quality. Every one of us have qualities about us that we're not real proud of. We talked a little bit about that last week and we, we all have that we just do. And I think that <clears throat> the the founders of our country fully realize that if you take a look at the books that they were reading up, <clears throat> up until they got into the Constitutional Convention, it's that, you know, hey, we need checks and balances against people that are in power. Otherwise, absolute power corrupts absolutely. And so they put together a, a, um, a constitution that not only supports separation of powers, which is why this whole impeachment process was so important, but separation of powers so that we would have checks and balances so that, that not one person would be making a decision that could just benefit that person or just a small group of people, that everyone gets to benefit and everyone's unalienable rights are, are protected. And on top of that constitutional system was the free market and the free market can be called capitalism. And so what the free market and, and free doesn't mean free, like socialism free, but it means that you're free to go ahead and do business. You can start up your own business. We've talked about starting business. Our whole show is about starting, starting over. A lot of that has to do with starting your own business and doing your own thing. The free market has everything to do with that. The founder's idea was that the government would pretty much stay out of that business because the way capitalism is supposed to work mm -hmm. is that 
hey, if you start a business and you take care of people and you take care of their needs, they're going to come back and continue to do business with you. But if you start a business and let remember the Tylenol and they they, they found uh, cyanide and Tylenol, boy, they right. almost went out of business right there. Uh, the reason they almost went out of business is because they weren't keeping track of what was going on in their labs and people were dying. Well, that's how capitalism is supposed to work. It's not supposed to be the government coming in and saying, hey, you're going out of business because X, Y, Z. The people, just like the people vote for their representatives and for the president, the people vote, vote with, with the their dollar. dollar. Exactly. I read this book by Dick DeVos several years ago called Compassionate Capitalism. Hey, we, the fact is, is that- Oh, it's a great book. I actually have goosebumps thinking about it because of the stories that I read. Mm -hmm. You know, the thing about capitalism is that it works the best when you start a business that is there to help other people to become yep. uh, either prosperous. Well, not either. Prosperous. Prosperous does, means a lot of different things. It, it could mean money. It could mean health. It could mean uh, happiness. But uh, a compassionate capitalism is focused on a win-win situation. Mm -hmm. And so that's why capitalism really works. And Agreed. this is, and, and that's not to say that you're not going to have people out there that start businesses to, uh, to rip people off. But the fact is, is that people start to realize that, Hey, these people aren't being fair. Maybe I should go down to the other, the other, uh, mm -hmm. the other business down the street. Cause I hear, you know, Joe's market is real fair and they always have a quality product. And it's funny because we were just talking about that earlier today when you were talking about the different businesses here in the United States versus doing businesses outside of the United States. And really, we are the home of the free market. We are the home of capitalism. And that's why it's much safer to do business here. Yeah. But, you know, what's really interesting is this whole idea of socialism has become very popular in the United States. And I've wondered why that is, because when you look at what socialism slash communism has done over the last hundred years, they're responsible for over 100 million murders across the world. So you look at who are the most people, who is the biggest population of people that are supporting socialism? And we look at Bernie Sanders, who says that he's a uh, democratic socialist, which, by the way, I think is uh, an oxymoron. I don't think there's any such thing as a democratic socialist, Sure, especially if you've seen any of these Project Veritas videos of his campaign managers who have been filmed saying things like uh, put the rich people underneath of a guillotine and put the Republicans in re-education camps. Uh, this is this is socialism. Uh, socialism, is, it sounds great. Like, for instance, uh, Medicare for all sounds great, doesn't it? I mean, Always I, sounds great. I love the idea that everybody could have health care and they could just go and, sure. and, and get health care and, and they, they could do it at an affordable price. I, I love the idea. But when you take a look at what they're really proposing here, uh, they're proposing Hey, look, Medicare right now, the way it works is if you're 65 or older, you have a lot of help through Medicare, Medicaid, and you have choices as well. And it, and it works very, it works pretty good. I know that, you know, my, my mom's on Medicare, so it, it's working well for her. But what we're looking at doing here is we're looking at, at changing Medicare uh, fundamentally not the way that it is today. And we're gonna provide it to everyone and it's a single payer system, meaning that there are no choices. Everything's run through the government. And remember that Obamacare was supposed to be a single payer system. Mm -hmm. uh, and, and thank God that they were able to uh, eliminate that. A single payer system means that literally millions of people are suddenly out of a job. Because if you take a look at the insurance business today, healthcare insurance it literally employs millions of people across the world. Once you do Medicare for all, 
every one of those people's jobs become illegal and they're out. So what are they going to do? Work for the government and work for the government. That means I'm paying for your salary as, as my, as a taxpayer. So let's take a look at how much it's going to cost for Medicare for all. And Bernie's proposal is about, well, it's over $30 trillion over the next 10 years. When you th think about trillion dollars, it's really hard to fathom, but a, a good comparison would be that our, to take a look at our gross national product. Now, gross national product is everything that we made as far as financially, the money that we made in America during a particular year. Do you know that right now we're somewhere between 16 and $20 trillion as our gross national product? So That's when impressive. You, you take a look at what he is asking for. He's, one, he's putting a price tag on something that exceeds everything that we've made exponentially exceeds everything that we've made in a particular year. That means that everything you made, everything I made, everything my mom made, everything my stepfather made, everything my kids made, we'd have to put everything into that bucket and it still would not equal the cost of this. The next thing yeah. is free education. Free education, that <laughs> yeah, sounds sure. great. But, yeah. but, but hold on a second about that. Free education... Oh, okay, let's take a look at where we're getting free education right now. Well, we do the public school systems. You don't have to pay to send your kids there, although you do have to pay taxes on that. So it's not really free. There's really nothing's nothing ever free. free here. By the way, here in California, they have a new uh, levy going on in this in in the state. It's going to be on the ballot again. They keep asking us to pay, you know, m m billions more dollars into the uh, the public school system here, yet every time we vote yes and give more money, and the all, always the reason is because the kids aren't up to par on math and science sure. and, and sure. they need help. <laughs> Who doesn't support that? But every time we put another few billion dollars into it, the math and science scores go down. What? Mm -hmm. And we find out that the money is going towards the, these pension liabilities so that um, what happens is the kids aren't getting the benefit, but the teachers, when they retire, they, they get an amazing amount of money. They've got free benefits. I mean, who gets free benefits? Not, not, not just while you're working, but after you work for you and your family when you're retired, free benefits for life. That's what we're paying for. And sure. it's not helping the kids. What the heck? So the other thing I think about free education is this, is, you know, you and I went to the same college. We're at Kent State University and I paid my own way. So you're going to give that to somebody for free when I worked my butt off to sure. afford it for myself? Uh, am I going to get recompensated for that? That doesn't sound fair. And then finally, let's say this. You take a look at anything that's for free. We talked about it earlier. Quality versus quantity. Are you really going to get a quality education if it's free, if it's run by the government? Look where it's at now. Look what's happened over decades uh, with our public school system. And yeah, it's ridiculous. Uh, I was going to suggest that too, as well with healthcare, with education. As soon as the government takes control of these things, the quality goes to shit. I mean, it really does. So if it costs, I think you said 30 trillion a year for Medicaid, then yeah. what do you think it's going to cost the following year and the year and the decade after that? Forget about it. It's not. Uh, let me ask you this. This is uh, going to be kind of interesting, I think. So the whole premise about socialism is to take from the, the top tiers of the population that are siphoning off all of our money. And there is a problem there, I will say, uh, to an extent. It depends on how you look at it. Uh, <clears throat> I think there is a bit of a fairness that needs to be had, and that is in the way of taxes. What happened to the talk of, and forgive me, I don't remember which is the correct one, flat tax or fair? or free tax. Uh, they're mis one is a misnomer, but the tax where everything, all taxes are done away with except for sales tax. So the more you buy, 
the more you're paying in tax. Want to buy a yacht or a helicopter? Well, you're paying a lot more in tax and so on. So it does end up being a lot more fair. Do you know what happened to the, that talk that used to be big 10 years ago, 20 yeah, years ago? Yeah, we, we've definitely heard quite a lot. Remember uh, Herman Cain with 999. That was his tax plan. It was very simple. Of course, they said that he was they, – they figured out some way to come up with uh, – uh, reason why he shouldn't be elected president, but uh, that's a whole nother story. The, here's the deal here, though. When you take a look at fairness, I, I, you know, th- we could debate this for a long time, I think. But the fact of the matter is, is that the top five percent of earners here in this country pay more than 70 percent of the actual taxes that get paid in this country. The bottom 50 percent of the earners here in this country pay for a tiny fraction. Uh, Many of the people aren't paying taxes at all, federal taxes at all. So I agree with you. There's nothing there's something very not fair about the way the tax system is set up right now. But it seems to me that as a country, when we attack the rich and say that they're not paying their fair share, it doesn't appear that that's actually the truth. And when you take a look at what's happened, let's say, for instance, in the state of New York, that they're very much going after the rich. They're they're moving out of New York. And and when whenever a high profile person moves out of New York, uh, usually the governor says something like good riddance, uh, get them out of here. Well, the fact is, is that these people are paying an exorbitant amount of that tax base. And when you chase them out because of unfair practices, it hurts everybody. Mm -hmm. So there's something wrong with that whole approach when we attack the the top 2% or the top 1%. The top 1% pays something like 50% of our tax base. So we, we do, when you take a look at Reaganomics, the trickle down effect, that whole thing, what we've seen and what's been proven out economically is that that absolutely works because when you do that, more businesses open up, more jobs become available. When we lessen regulation, uh, there, that makes more money available to corporations so that they can pay higher wages and they can and, and, and people do better under those circumstances. It's very uh, socialistic or even fascists to look at businesses as a government and start controlling how they pay their people. And that's the difference. Socialism and fascism are very related to each other. And that's the difference between those two, that capitalist type of mentality versus the socialist mentality is that the, the capitalist mentality is more laissez-faire. The socialist mentality or fascist mentality is take over the businesses, tell them what they can and can't do, how much people can get paid, and uh, regulate that whole thing. And by the way, we're taking this much tax out of you as well because you are basically a pawn of our government. And when that happens, the people normally don't do well. Well, and then it de-incentivizes people to actually work at all. That's yeah. the truth. So that's a that's the really horrible end of it. But you know we're not going to be able to solve this here in a few minutes anyway because I, I it's that, it's endlessly complex. I do I, have I, one thing to say ahead. about this that I, I don't want to leave out here in California where I live in in Woodland Hills. Um, I I live in a pretty nice neighborhood I th- I think and um, it's the suburbs in the San Fernando Valley. But over the last several years, because of the socialist type policies that have happened here, there's been a phenomenon that is going on that I find terribly distasteful and disgusting. Um, One of the things that we've seen is uh, almost the elimination of the middle class. So here in California, what you have is you've got either the uber rich or the super poor, and it's the middle class that is really suffering here. So here in my neighborhood, we have people that live on the hill. Uh, the the hill is where you want to live because that's where all the mansions are. And then you have the people that live in the valley. Well, these are where your middle class people are, like like myself. 
And um, what we're seeing here is this influx of, you know, we're a sanctuary state as well. Mm -hmm. This influx of homelessness that's happening here is just at critical levels. I haven't seen it like this before. Every month it gets even worse. Uh, There are tents all around my neighborhood now, people that are living on the sidewalks, living in tents, Mm -hmm. or they've figured out some type of makeshift home that they've built, and they're just living right there on the street. And what the what the government is calling it is a homeless problem. But what there's a guy by the name of Dr. Drew. You may have heard of him. Oh, he's, sure. a, he's a TV celebrity. He's an actual doctor. He's thinking about running for Congress here against Adam Schiff. Uh, mm-hmm. He's in his district. I would love to see him take that. But he yeah. said that he, he spends a lot of time with these homeless people. And uh, I always say, there by the grace of God go I. I'm not attacking homeless people. But no. what I am seeing is this. It, this is what the doctor is reporting, is that it's really not a homeless problem. What you have here are two major factors. One is you've got a mental health issue here. Sure. And uh, over the years, we've eliminated these mental health facilities and we've emptied those out, those people out into the streets. And now they don't have their meds and they don't know how to take care of themselves. They think it's just fine to live on the street and they don't want to actually live anyplace else. And there's nothing you can do about that except for help them with their mental health problem. That's what needs to happen. And the second problem is drugs. We've got a major meth and heroin problem here. So 90% of the people that are homeless that are out on the street right now are either mentally ill or they're addicted to some type of a hard drug. Now, I pay uh, huge taxes to live here in this in this in this state and in this town. <clears throat> the police are not enforcing any type of laws uh, that would protect our property. You, you, oh, there's another thing I forgot to mention. These these old campers, I don't know, they're like campers from the 70s that yeah. are all rusted out and they're everywhere. I think I pointed these out to you when you were here. They're, there's more, where are they coming pointed from? Pointed them out. They were lining all of Santa Monica Beach. You all couldn't... of the beautiful places. They're just lined up over there. Free oceanfront and, property. And by the way, the sewage that comes from those things, they, 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 they put up, that goes into the ocean or onto the street. So it's putrid in this area now. Now, or here in my neighborhood, they'll just pull up in front of your house and, and live there. And there's nothing that you can do. If you call the police, they won't do anything about it. And these people, many of them are dangerous because they've got mental health or drug issues. So now, you know, you don't want your wife or your children walking around in the street or this beautiful park that I have right down the street. There's homeless people living all around there. I don't want my kid going over there. My kids are older, but I wouldn't want, let's say when I have grandchildren, I wouldn't want them to go play over there with a meth, with a bunch of meth heads and, mm-hmm. and heroin addicts and mentally, uh, uh mental health, uh, patients that are running around. That sounds like a, a terrible recipe for disaster. And one final thing I'll say about this is I was talking to my friend Mo, uh, who lives in New Hampshire. And when she saw, and this will lead into our politics, when she saw the primary results in New Hampshire, she was shocked that Bernie could win that. You know, Mm -hmm. Bernie is from the neighboring state of Vermont. And what she says is when she goes into Vermont, the prices for everything are sky high there. I mean, it's just unaffordable to live there. And it's because it's a socialist state. Mm -hmm. And so this is, and and so the people of New Hampshire can see this because New Hampshire and Vermont, I mean, let's face it, you could probably ride your bicycle between the two states within a day. Uh, Why would they, why would they vote for Bernie Sanders when they can see exactly what his policies actually do to the society? So, um, you know, we talked a lot about uh, Bernie Sanders or, or about socialism, but uh, those are the things that he stands for. And I think it's very interesting when we look at what's happening in the news these days, because, of course, right now, Bernie Sanders is the front runner and the liberal media or the leftist media. I, I, I'm sorry, Mainstream I media, it's the same thing. Yeah, well, what they're saying is you take a look at the results of the the primary in New Hampshire and 
clearly Bernie won that by a small margin, but he did win that. And then you had Buttigieg and then you had Klobuchar after that. But when you watch the media, you'll hear them say, well, really, you know, uh, Klobuchar and Buttigieg are more of the mainstream um, center of the world liberals. And if you combine the two together, they trounced Bernie. And so they're they're actually claiming that Bernie lost because it's socialism versus liberalism and liberalism wins when you combine two uh, opponents together. But I, I've got news for the news people. That's not how our election system <laughs> works. And, and so what's happening is we're seeing this very uh, desperate sign coming from the Democratic Party that they are deathly afraid that Bernie's going to be the front runner and he's going to go into this election or, or into the uh, convention, and he's going to be the Democratic nominee going against Trump. Well, the latest Gallup polls that are out there are showing that the majority of the people here in this country don't want socialism. Right. I mean, it is, uh, it's 45% don't want social, uh, are for socialism, and 53% don't want. Well, That's okay. close. That, it's it's cl- statistically um, that means that he doesn't have a chance. But 45% want socialism? That's Amazing. outrageous. Are you kidding me? But here's the other thing is um, an atheist doesn't do much better here. So I believe Bernie Sanders has claimed that he's a, an atheist. Uh, the uh, the Gallup poll shows that an atheist would not be able to win an election nor a socialist. Interestingly, the same poll shows that uh, over 90% would either vote for uh, a black person, a woman, a Hispanic, uh, or even a gay person. So you can see, and it's funny, I was looking at these polls going back to the 60s. You can see this evolution that's happened where people have become accepted, whether you're a man or a woman or black or you're Hispanic. Um, we live in a world today that is very accepting But if you watch the media, you'll see a whole different story that seems like we live in the most prejudiced country. Oh, yeah. And we just. I I just have to set the record straight. I I Googled that on Sanders. He's very offended by being called an atheist. It seems like it started with a Christian magazine calling him that. But he does say he's totally non denominational but he does he's very offended by being called an atheist i think we just have to put it out there i think i heard him call himself an atheist so i don't know i, I think I, you should cite that source things. i think yeah, you should I, cite that source yeah i can't look it up i can't look things up as fast as you can so i'll have to look at that again but um but back to socialism mm-hmm. They're not. They're not for it, and I think the media coverage of this is uh, is pretty interesting. And you take a look at Joe Biden. I mean, what do you think about his chances of going forward, Barry? Zero, absolutely zero. What and happened? <laughs> I I think Trump's got it right. He just doesn't have the energy for it. I don't think he ever did. It's like he thought he would, like Hillary. He thought he was going to be handed the reins. And that's all, you know, it was going to take. And I mean, it just takes a lot more than that. The other thing is for sure, that party is so divided and it is just in total chaos. And frankly, I think it's in a total tailspin that, as you said, now they're trying to, <laughs> I never heard that before, but what the media said about putting together those Buttigieg and uh, what's her, what's her name? Klob- the Klobuchar. Klob- Klobuchar. Uh, but the two of them equal beating Bernie. That's yeah. hysterical. Uh, Chris uh, Matthews not only said that, but he said that they trounced Bernie. <laughs> <laughs> trounced him? <laughs> I don't I don't know if if you had to really if you had to put big money on who you think is going to win the Democratic uh, con- uh, uh, primary. Who do you think that would be? Boy, that's a tough, uh, a tough one. Um, I, I I think it's going to be Bernie, actually. I, I don't see how Bernie doesn't lose this. He seems to have uh, the most support. 
anytime I see uh, crowds, the, the biggest crowds are always around Bernie and none of the other candidates. Um, I see this Michael Bloomberg thing being um, oh, I forgot about him. interesting factor. And I believe that somehow in some way they're trying, they're going to try to, uh, uh, you know, rip Bernie off in the, in the, in the, right. the convention using Bloomberg. And it's interesting to see what Bloomberg is doing out there. Uh, I, I'm actually disturbed by what I'm seeing with Bloomberg. What do you think? Um, I think Bloomberg throws the biggest wrench into the party, uh, of all of them, uh, if, if he's got yet another wedge to throw into a party that's already divided, you know, being I'm the billionaire to go against the billionaire. And yet I don't think that he could stand up against Trump for a m moment. If I had to put money on a candidate, I think it's going to be Buttigieg based on that. He's a moderate and then his upward trajectory right now. Just keep well, following the chart. You know, it's really interesting, and I I was thinking that before, but now that I see a lot of the polls that are out there, it's it's that he really is look was looking good in Iowa and New Hampshire, but the rest of the primaries that are out there, he's not polling well at all. He's polling very low. Um, one of the things about uh, Buttigieg is that he's not pulling well amongst black voters. And with the oh. Democratic Party, if you don't have the black vote, you're not going to win. And which is really interesting about the Joe Biden strategy as he is uh, he left New Hampshire early and right. he went down to uh, South, South Carolina. <clears throat> you know, I thought it was interesting that he went to South Carolina because the next primary is actually in Nevada. So you're going to skip Nevada. And I think that speaks volumes that he left the New Hampshire primary early. Those were uh, his constituents were campaigning rigorous, rigorously for them. But he he didn't even stick around to say thank you. Then he went down to South Carolina and you see him with a lot of black people behind him saying that, you know, over 95 percent of the black and brown people have not weighed in yet. And it's not over yet. And then he says, quote, our votes count. And uh, I mean, the last time I looked at Joe Biden, I, I didn't know he was black or brown, but uh, apparently he must be. And I'm hearing that um, the, from the, uh, the the polls that are out there right now that black uh, the black community is very concerned about the viability of Joe Biden. Mm. And so he he I may think, think that he's going to be getting those votes. But Bloomberg is actually making a huge push for the black vote. And I think he's stealing Joe Biden's lunch. Oh. Interestingly. Tell me more. Uh, Tell me in, more about Bloomberg. Well, take, he's, take. here's my take on Bloomberg is that uh, ultimately he fails on the black vote as well, because now you've got these videos out there where he's talking about the success of stop and frisk policies right. in New York City when he was the mayor. And he's talking about how the majority of Crimes are committed by majority by mi minorities, and therefore the stop and frisk policy it was directed towards minorities. And look, we were able to lower the crime rate and blah blah blah. He's well, trying to get out in front of it. He's already apologized. Well, you know, you can apologize all you want, but that was a policy that you ran the biggest city in the country with, and Trump so would I just, eat them alive. I just yeah. don't believe that. And you know, I somebody was telling me, well, look, it, it had a dramatic effect on the crime rate. And I got to say that the Constitution is, 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 you know, your Bill of Rights uh, prevent that from happening. That's actually anti-constitutional to just stop and frisk somebody. That's, that is not a, an American ideal right sure. there. And I think that, um, I, I really believe that what what's really happening with the black vote is that Trump is the one that's going to eat the Democrats lunch on this, because when you start to see the statistics of what has happened with the black community because of the policies of of President Trump, 
Uh, you've got a lower lowest That's unemployment true. rate ever, not just with black people, but also with Hispanics. Uh, you've got a lot of other things that are going on as well that we could go into. But I think when it comes down to it, uh, there was, uh, I think... Who was it? I think it was Ronald Reagan that said, it's the economy, stupid. <laughs> it's the economy. It's always going to be the economy that makes a difference in elections. And I think that the black community sees this as well. And I don't think that uh, the Democrats are going to have a chance. In fact, I really believe that we're seeing the demise of the Democratic Party the way that too. it is right now. I do, too. You know, I just had an interesting thought going back to our socialism, uh, it, putting this all together, is if Bernie were to get elected and the stock market instantly crashed and our economy would rather quickly go down the tubes, do you know what de Democrats would say for years? This is Trump's economy. Yeah, no, that's that, exactly what they would say. Because you know how they give Obama credit for the Trump economy now. Well, and remember how Obama always said that he in, he inherited all these terrible economic uh, situations, and I mean he never took uh, took any credit for the economy when it was bad. And now right. that Trump is doing yeah. well, all the Democrats are saying, "Oh, it was Obama," especially yeah, but, Nancy Pelosi. But I'm telling you, it's a scary, sobering thought. If Bernie Sanders were to get elected and you would see the economy go down the tubes quickly, I know that, uh, it would all be blamed on Trump. And and that would just be the effort to continue to uh, go down that socialist. I agree. I agree. Hey, one question. What happened with Elizabeth Warren? Oh, I God. Mean, she God was the her. front runner just not that long ago. And here she she comes in what fourth or fifth place in New Hampshire when Massachusetts is right next door. Again, you could ride your bicycle there mm -hmm. and, and they share the same media and everything. And it, she, she doesn't even hit the radar at all. What happened? Dude, there's nothing authentic about her. She comes off as such a phony. So for some reason, somebody coached her, or maybe it was her own harebrained idea to come out in the last year or so and talk really softly to everybody. And I think it's to <laughs> do the opposite of Trump, you know, to be the anti-Trump. I think that's her strategy. But there's nothing authentic about her. And, you know, I, that, that takes us back to uh, who was the young guy from Texas that they were anointing? Oh, uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, his name, but he was so inauthentic as well. And yeah. which they were doing commercials. He's like trying to work. Oh, he's getting a, He's in the dentist chair and he's doing uh, commercials like that. Elizabeth sorry. Warren, let's have a beer. Let's just have a beer here. And I, it's just pathetic. It's so cringy. And, and that's the thing. I cannot stand Trump. When I look back on some of the things that they unearthed to try to bring them down and stuff, I, I get it. I get it. He is so embarrassing, but he is 100% authentic without apology, unapologetically authentic. And, uh, and, and he produces like nobody would have ever seen because he just doesn't play. He just doesn't play with the establishment. You know, he goes right through them. And I think that's why he was elected. I agree Absolutely. with you that uh, he's 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 an outsider, and people are getting sick of the of of being, I say, carnied by these uh, by these career politicians yeah. that will say anything. Um, you know, uh, they'll they'll take on a uh, ebonics. You know, I'm going to speak to these people <laughs> in ebonics so that they can understand me. How? how uh, what an insulting. insult that is that I can't understand Demeaning. you as a black person unless you speak Ebonics to me. I mean, that's just so insulting. But who was know, it that said I have hot sauce? I carry hot that sauce. That was Hillary Clinton. No, nah, I think Clinton. it was Kamala Harris. I no, think. I know it was Hillary. Was that Clinton. Hillary? Yeah, <laughs> because because uh, the next line was, well, it sounds like you're pandering to black people by saying that. And she says, is it working? And it's like, she said, okay, uh, she's admitting it. And uh, and then remember uh, the one where Hillary Clinton came out and she's, I've come too far to turn back now. And she had that whole thing going on. And, uh, and, and now Joe Biden has a commercial out with those exact same words that Hillary Clinton used. And that's what he's using down in South Carolina to get black people to vote for him. And I'm thinking, how, how does he think that that's going to work? 
Oh, like, that's it. And I'm just like, it completely insult- so insulting. So well, insulting to out, one's intelligence. I found out that the uh, the actual words come from an old Negro spiritual. And because uh, I like, why would they say the exact same word? So it was uh, Reverend James Cleveland has this thing out, uh, you know, back in the 50s. And those are the words to the song. But really, you got to speak to me in an old <laughs> Negro spiritual for me to. <laughs> <laughs> that's it pathetic funny, it's yeah, pathetic going back to elizabeth warren with the you know let's have a beer i mean it seemed to me like she had never had a beer before in her life <laughs> i, I she swear it did it, like that it just have you noticed, spit like, it out you know have you noticed that she basically wears the same thing every time it, she, well she's she's got that long sweater kind of uh thing she wears on the outside and then she's got like this Black, uh, uh, I don't know, it's like a tank top or something that she's wearing over. And it's always different colors on the the jacket, but it's the same style. And it's always like, it looks like she's wearing a leotard or something underneath of that. It's her version of the Hillary pantsuit. You know, uh, but it's her at least Hillary wore different stuff. I mean, yeah, she always wore pantsuit, but it was different. But the underneath thing that she's wearing, mm. it's the same thing every single time. And I I just think that that's really odd. I mean, if I came on the show and wore the exact same thing every time, people would be like, hey, do you ever change your clothes, Mo? Exactly. So I, I just a lot of weirdness going on out there. Hey, man, we're at a minute, uh, uh, an hour nine. And I got to I gotta leave you with this, though. Try to create a visual for the podcast listeners. But the funniest meme I've ever seen in my life was this. One of those small planes it is sitting in a hangar. But it was riddled with arrows all on the bottom, just completely full. And the caption was uh, Elizabeth Warren's plane coming back from a convention at the Indian (laughs) Nation. (laughs) That is good. (laughs) I laughed. I I said that to so many people. I love that. All right. So it looks like we got a lot of material for next time that we got to cover. All kinds of stuff. But this is a fun one. Uh, Love talking about this stuff. So Me too, Barry. All right. Hey, guys, please uh, like us, share us, and uh, give us a five-star rating so that we can reach more people. And check us out at over50startingover.com. You'll find all your favorite platforms available right there. And email us, mail, at over50startingover.com. Yep. Love your comments. All right. Good show, Barry. Yeah, sure was. See you next week, Merle. Yeah, take care.